so when uh, Ernie and I, our dean, who, by the way, is at Lee Annenberg's memorial service in Philadelphia, so he can't be here today. But um, when we first started talking about this series, which is, this is the first of a series of conversations called The Art of the Long View, uh, the point that I had was that it seemed to me that most of the media investment conferences that the three of us have go to focus very much on the next two quarters, two or the, the next two <laughs> weeks, as Gordon says. And so we thought it would be helpful at an institution like Annenberg, which is not really focused on that, to, to have a long view of this. And so today, I'm really pleased to have our first two guests to really think about what the media company of the next 10, 15 years is going to look like. Um, Gordon Crawford has been called by Business Week the most savvy media investor in the world. Uh, when I was an investment banker in 1984, already for 12 years he had been investing in media companies, had been a critical shareholder for Warner Communications at a really important time when Steve Ross was building the company. He invested in Peter's company, News Corp, quite a bit. He was probably the largest shareholder from time to time of Viacom, Yahoo, many other companies. Uh, Peter Chernin, for the last 14 years, has been president and chief operating officer of News Corp, which, as you all know, owns 20th Century Fox, Fox Broadcasting, The Wall Street Journal, MySpace, and many other properties. So he has a very wide vision of what the media universe is about. So I thought I'd just start asking <coughs> Gordon, because you started investing in 72 in this media business, what was it about the communications, media, telecom sector that attracted you when you first started making these large bets in the sector? Well, first of all, when I came into the business in 72, um, it, it was an inc the, the existing media business was an incredibly attractive business to invest in. Um, you know, uh, television stations were uh, local oligopolies that had 55% pre-tax margins, no capital spending to speak of. I mean, you bought a helicopter every once in a while uh, or a camera, but it, it was all free cash flow. Radio stations had 40% margins. Um, newspapers had 25 to 30% margins. Uh, advertising grew almost every year. Even in recessions, they grew. They just grew less fast. Um, you could leverage them. Uh, and so the value of them grew over time at a fairly, fairly high rate with the leverage in there. And they always sold at 65% of what they were worth. And there was always industry consolidation. So every couple of years, one of your holdings would get taken over at a 50% premium. And so for, from 1972 to 1995, it was pretty much like shooting fish in a barrel, <laughs> investing in the media business. There was, I mean, it doesn't matter whether it was a good management or a bad management. It was just a great, these were great businesses with really no major threat to them. But, but should have gotten out then. I should have gotten out then. <laughs> <laughs> but that kind of leads me into the next, the next point, which is, um, you know, as an investor in the, in the media business, or as Peter was, you know, running a major company, it's critical when you look at the, the way people consume entertainment and information, it's critical to understand technology. Technology has always been um, what's driven these long cycles in the media entertainment business. And it's very disruptive. Uh, it creates enormous wealth for the new ways in which things are, are delivered, and it also creates huge value destruction. And this has been true. You can go all the way back to, to uh, 1836, when a 39-year-old German inventor, uh, Johann Gutenberg, invented the movable type printing press. And it just fundamentally changed the way people received information. You didn't have to be a king to get a, a book hand, handwritten by a monk. Uh, you know, you, you could bring newspapers and books to the masses, and it fundamentally reordered media. Um, on December 6, 1877, Thomas Edison said, 
Mary Had a Little Lamb into a tinfoil cylinder recording music for the first time, and it created the, the music business, basically. Um, in the 1890s, Thomas Edison again, uh, with the Lumiere brothers in France, creates a motion picture camera and projector, and the movie industry is born. The first movie comes out, first full-length movie comes out in 1915, Birth of a Nation, and the movie industry takes off, and vaudeville is crushed. Um, and then in 1920, KDKA, the first radio station, goes on the air to announce the election results of, uh, of Harding and Cox, and the radio industry is born. Uh, uh, RCA, Radio Corporation of America, goes public in 1924 and goes up 10,000% between 1924 and the peak in 1929. And then um, this crazy farmer, uh, Philo T. Farnsworth, uh, starts to invent the television. He has a patent race with Vladimir uh, uh, Zworkin. Zworkin, who's backed by RCA, and the television business is born. And that creates the greatest mass medium of our time after the Second World War. Um, and then this crazy guy um, in, um, uh, in uh, Lansford, Pennsylvania, who was, uh, uh, who was trying to sell televisions, and, and nobody could get the television signals from the Philadelphia stations. So he's a television retailer, so he strings wire up in the top of the mountain and, and brings it down to his town, distributes the wire, and Panther Valley Television is the first cable TV system. Um, and that's kind of, when I came into the business, cable was just a, a retransmission device. And then I started in 72, following the media business, 1972, November 1972, HBO goes on the air. Fittingly, the first movie they showed was something called Sometimes a Great Notion, and <laughs> it was. Then in 75, they went up on satellite with a thriller from Manila. And then 76, WTBS, and then 80 with CNN, and that business took off. So every time one industry is hurt, another industry creates vast value. And I'm sure we'll talk later, but I would just throw out to you that that happened again. And just to pick a date, I'll pick August 6th, 1995, which it was the day Jerry Garcia died of the Grateful Dead, but it was also the day of the initial IPO of Netscape. And really, Netscape and AOL ushered in the age of the internet. And the value destruction since that moment in the old media business has been horrific. And, and you've created things like Google that have $160 billion market cap. So, so Peter, that's sometimes- That's a pretty good uh, history lesson there. Sometimes big media companies don't like to see these changes. I mean, we could all look at the effect of Napster on the music business, or even you and I were talking about video on demand in 1996, and it was kind of resisted in its own way by the major studios, uh, digital distribution of movies. What is it about the size and scale of the big media companies that sometimes worry about cannibalization? That was a word I kept hearing about, well, we'll cannibalize our DVD revenues if we assume, you know, undertake this digital distribution business? Well, I think a lot of what it is is that a lot of what, through all that history lesson, has allowed these big media companies to thrive has been significant barriers to entry, whether those are regulatory barriers to entry in the cases of television stations or radio stations, uh, financial barriers to entry, which probably still exist in the movie business to some degree. Uh, again, regulatory issues in the cable industry, because those are, those are licensed, uh, essentially licensed monopolies. Um, and those barriers to entry have created enormous wealth because you are, you know, the media companies have largely been functioning as semi-monopolies in those areas. And so, you know, as, as, as profit-making enterprises, I think in general they're interested in protecting that, that as long as they can. And I think most of the resistance, you know, there, there's some more specific resistances. You know, I think that there are some economic models that, that turn out to be unbelievably good and you, you see the media companies want to hold on to them. You know, I'll give you an example, which is, you know, the record industry, and frankly, it's one of the reasons why I think the record industry was so vulnerable to piracy, 
is they were getting people to spend $15, $18 to buy a full album when they wanted one song. And they would never disaggregate the songs off the albums because it was far more economically. So I think you will see specific business models that they will try and protect because they're too good to be true. You know, we can talk about this later, but I think that you know, what, what has really happened you know, in the last 10, 10, 15 years because of technology is that the days when you can protect those things are largely done. You know, I think that the power has now moved to the consumer and you cannot protect those, those non-viable business, you know, those non-consumer friendly business models any longer. Okay, so let's, let's just take one example of that that's happening right now. Um, I was listening to a conference call at UBS yesterday and, and Warren Lieberfarb, who some people claim, or he certainly claims, is the father of the DVD. Yes, he saying, does. <laughs> saying, uh, well, the era of people buying movies on DVD is probably over. That Netflix and Redbox and all these other things have, have changed that. I mean, do either of you see a, a, a really secular change in, in that huge revenue source for the movie business that's uh, sustained it for quite a while? I'll go. I do. You know, I think, I don't know whether it's over. I think that may be slightly hyperbolic, but I think that the days in which, you know, you can get, anytime somebody wants to be a, see a movie, you can get them to go down to Blockbuster or Best Buy or Walmart and buy that movie for $15. I think you're going to see that significantly decline. You know, we've seen that business decline. Right now, the rate of decline is running at about 15 to 20 percent year over year in the past year or so, the past 18 months. And I think you're going to continue to see it decline. I think that there will be certain movies which are looked at as being more collectible than others, you know, various animated movies, maybe the best picture or whatever mm -hmm. movie it is that you specifically want to see. But I think that, um, you know, the day is where you felt that was the only way to get it. I think those are gone. And, and frankly, I think in some ways, the bigger change, a bigger change than Netflix and certainly a bigger change in, than, than Redbox is going to be the transition from uh, hard goods, from owning a physical copy of something, to electronic delivery of these things. You know, and I think the easiest way to look at that is when's the last time any of, anybody in this room bought a CD? Right. You know, I, I just think that you know, it's remarkable how quickly those things go. Last week. Okay. <laughs> the Beatles. I, I, I was my case, right? <laughs> the, the Beatles reissues, right? Okay. And I think that, in, you know, if you're looking at electronic, um, if, if these things are ubiquitously available essentially for rent right. on a video on demand basis, right. I'm not sure, you know, if you can get it anytime you want and watch it for three, four dollars, why you're going to want to download it to own on your hard drive for fifteen dollars. There will be right. some people who want to do that, some people who are traveling, who want it on their computer for traveling purposes, but right. I think you're going to see, in terms of electronic distribution, you're going to see a big transition from a sell-through model to an on-demand model okay. and, and at significantly lower margins. Corey, what, what, what is I, your thought? I, I completely, I'd like to be controversial, but I completely agree with Peter. I think it's... Is that, is that going to be a play for um, affluent customers, though? Because I got the Roku streaming device that plugs me into Netflix, plugs me into their deep library. They already have a lot of stuff available that you can stream. But it seems like it's for cinephiles and people who have a certain taste level or whatever. It doesn't seem like a mass market play. And I just wonder, do you think it will be a mass market play within 20 years' time, that type of yes. streaming? Yes, I think it will be a mass market play within three years' time. Really? Okay, so <laughs> this, this gets to your, <laughs> initial, your initial comment about <clears throat> HBO, which was HBO started out as a movie service. The thing that keeps video on demand from happening today is obviously that HBO, Showtime, and Stars Encore carve out video on demand rights as well as pay TV rights for a certain period. So no one can keep a large library of content available on demand anytime you want. In other words, if you go and look at Netflix's library of what you could get on CD, v, DVD, as opposed to what you could get on Netflix on demand, Big it's hugely different. Do you think the major companies will reconfigure this business to make this vision that Peter has possible? Yeah, they, they have, it's, the, it's the inevitable, immutable march of technology. It's gonna happen. It's just, this industry is so parochial and short-sighted that 
they keep doing pay TV deals and giving Showtime stars and HBO the, the video rights in that window, which just screws up making right. it available to the customer whenever, whenever they, they want. Because right. HBO has those rights, but they don't have a service. So right. um, uh, the contracts with the guilds are a nightmare. Um, they just, but, but again, as Peter says, if you go out enough years, I don't know whether it's five years or eight years or whatever, you're going to have bandwidth that's multiples faster than it is totally. today. You're going to have, storage is going to cost nothing. And these issues are going to get resolved, and people are going to have access to every movie ever made whenever they want it, either on a pay-per-view or a subscription basis. And so, and, and you'll be able to get it on your television, on your Apple tablet, on your, uh, your phone. iPhone, and it's going to be a great world. And, and the industry will adjust to it, but that's where we're going. Here's where we're, we are. It's kind of hard to, f there's a whole bunch of things that have to happen, but they will happen. Also, to be fair, right, even today, pick a number, 70% of on-demand purchases are new releases, and those are not affected by those HBO windows. But they're only in that window for yeah. a very short but, but period that's what, of time. But people want to see them as soon right. as they're available. Right. right. So it is an issue for sort of universal availability or ubiquitous availability. Right. But in terms of consumer appetite, most of the consumer appetite is for new releases. They want to see these movies right. as soon as they're available in their homes, and those are not affected by the pay TV restrictions. Yeah. Yeah, I, I've used the term interregnum. The old is dying and the new can't quite be born and we're just kind of caught in this middle place here that we have to go. So Gordon, you, you were a, almost a partner of Steve Ross in the building, what I think was the great media conglomerate of the early 60s, 70s, and 80s. And, and you watched it build and build and now probably in the last five, 10 years you've seen it kind of come apart. I mean. They sold off the cable, they sold off the record company. Do you think there's ever a time when this sense of giant conglomerate will still be relevant in this space, or is it more smaller focused companies that will dominate? Well, I, I would just go back to the point that, that Peter made earlier. Uh, again, from when I started in 1972 to 1995, these were great businesses, and they were all protected businesses. So um, the idea of, of, of leveraging up and consolidating, I mean, I, I watched it. It wasn't only Warner, but it was uh, Capital Cities, you know, right. which became Capital Cities ABC, which then became Disney. Um, the idea of leveraging up, buying these great cash cows that had cash flows that went up all the time, um, and then vertically integrating, because you had these wonderful things and you wanted to protect them. So if you owned HBO, you wanted to own a studio so that you were protected. And that made a lot of sense in the 70s and 80s and into the 90s. The trouble now with all these conglomerates is that so many of the business models of various parts of their empire are being are a train wreck, um, that it's caused all these stresses and strains. And so, and then when you look at the internet, there hasn't been much of a dynamic of consolidation like that. Right. So I, I do think so the new that model is going to be. I think you will see both things happen in the short term. I think you'll see greater consolidation because I think what you're going to see is you're going to see a number of these companies get really challenged. Mm -hmm. And the first thing that will happen is they'll sell to each other. So you'll see the stronger of those companies take over the weaker ones. And at the same time, you're going to see lots of upstarts coming from down below. You'll see the next Google. You'll see you know, the, the next one of those things. You'll see the next Amazon. You know, you'll begin to see these startups. But what will, get, what will get destroyed first is the underperforming of the big companies. And they'll get taken over. They're not going to go away. They'll get taken over by somebody That's else first. Right. Right. But, but, are, but, but they're, also, we gonna getting get, they're also going to get rationalized because you had Time Warner. Right. Time, Time Warner just spun off their cable division. Right. They are going to sell their print division. Right. They're, they're going to spin AOL. off AOL. Right. Right. And they're just going to be Warner Brothers, HBO, and the Turner Networks. Right. Now, they will make acquisitions, because Peter's right. The, the, the week, or the, there's going to be a winnowing out process. But they're probably going to buy just stuff in, that, in their wheelhouse of those businesses. They're not going to, I don't think, you know, go very far afield from right. the core competency. OK, so let's talk about this winnowing out process. The last time I checked, there are probably 
400 niche cable networks, cable and satellite networks. I mean, Discovery Channel has 15 different channels. Discovery Kids, Discovery Animal Planet, Discovery this. In 10 years, will we see that or will the television world look very different, a more on-demand world? Will there be 400 niche cable networks in 10 years? Want me to go? go. I, I think it is the single biggest <clears throat> question facing the media industry. Because if you look at these companies right now, they are generally, the big companies are generally, despite all the noise, they're cable companies. You know, you look at you look at News Corp, you look at Time Warner, you look at Disney, you look at Viacom. Cable networks. They are essentially 60 to 70 percent of their profits come from cable channels. Mm -hmm. and, and that's clearly the one bright spot in those companies right now. They're growing nicely, they're strong, et cetera. The question is, and I don't think it's a five-year question, I think it's a 15-year question, but in 15 years, is that the cable video model vulnerable to the same disaggregation that's taken place everywhere else, where people go, wait a second, all this stuff I have, first of all, every television in America within a few years will be IP enabled. Right. You know, you're gonna sort of see. Totally beginning at CES this year, they're all gonna have IP connections. And all of a sudden, your, cable, you know, your television set is gonna be your computer. Yeah. And when there are thousands of pieces of content available there, ranging from UGC stuff on YouTube, right. to virtually any show you wanna buy on an on a, on a on-demand basis on Apple TV, to Hulu, right. to everything right. else, are, are consumers gonna go, wait a second, this $120 a month that I'm paying for 400 channels, when I want to watch 10 or 15 of them, right. will that sustain? Now you're going to see, it goes back to where we started this conversation, the first thing you're going to see is you're going to see the cable companies do exactly what HBO did, which is you're going to see them really try and restrict the ability of their channel suppliers to make their content available elsewhere. That's what this TV Everywhere is, that's sort of the dynamics going on inside Hulu right, right now. But there's a certain inevitability that I believe that at some point that it is a model that's very vulnerable to the same disaggregation that's taken place every, el every right. place else. And then, you know, Katie bar the doors, because then I don't know what these media companies are. Corey, what do you think? I, I, I think Peter's right. Uh, I would just add a couple of things. A couple of the wild cards are if, <clears throat> if Congress or the FCC, which they've talked about periodically, if they ever uh, impose um, a la carte pricing on cable networks, then 250 of your 400 channels will disappear overnight because they just don't have the support uh, to, uh, to survive. Um, and the other thing, which would be terrible uh, in Peter's scenario, is if piracy goes unchecked uh, and we do, I mean, right now, with recorded music, files were so small that it that this aggregation happened very quickly right. and piracy proliferated. Nobody could stop it, uh, and it happened. The reason it hasn't happened in video is that you have large file sizes, particularly if you go to the HD, um, slow bandwidth speeds. Uh, most people do not have their computer connected to their television, right. and and frankly, the, the the pricing models, unlike the recorded music industry, are pretty fair in this business. But it doesn't mean that if, 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 it, if it starts to happen that you can see, um, you know, Mad Men or uh, True Blood, and it's, it's easily pirated, then it's going gonna, it's gonna to really it's hurt. It's easily pirated problems. right now. You know, there's well, not a but, single... But it becomes more socially... Right. right now, video is not quite the same yeah. as... Okay, well, let's, let's talk a little bit about piracy, because it seems... I saw some statistics that 90% of the home video revenue in China, Asia, most of South America is pirated anyway. I mean, just that. I mean, when you guys look at 20th Century Fox's revenues in the, in the DVD market in Asia, it almost is a rounding error, right? It doesn't exist. Right. We've always said... But that's, to be fair, that's not the piracy. That that's, physical piracy. that's physical piracy. It's people stealing a master copy somewhere, you know, we're buying the first copy or well, doing a camcorder and then running off but counterfeit, you know, counterfeit DVDs. I, and, I agree. But and the internet piracy far more insidious in the long run. Well, I mean, but it's of a piece because when you, if somebody goes to rip a DVD and then makes 100,000 copies of it and sells it on the streets in China, 
this is the same issue. Where, where he gets access to the original piece of content seems to me be less relevant than the fact that we as a country have essentially <coughs> moved to building a knowledge society. The only things we export that anybody else wants is movies, intellectual property. Intellectual property, you know, and we don't make cars that anybody wants in the rest of the world, but we do make pieces of desire. But we're also living in a world where nobody really gives a fig about our ideas of intellectual property. Now, but that, but that is a hopeful thing, though, because that will change, hopefully. How will this change? Well, as, as, as countries move up uh, the developmental cycle, uh, things like rule of law um, begin to come in. Uh, they, they're beginning to develop their own That's, film I think, the industry, thing. and they don't have, have their own stuff to The protect. Chinese right. actors right. and actresses and screenwriters don't want to get it stolen. And th so I think over the next 20 years, China will crack down on the guy in the corner, right. and, and, uh, and a legitimate market will develop. The renminbi uh, will become more valuable versus the dollar. They'll get instead of $2, to, you I get $4. I always used to joke that they have a calendar somewhere with a date circled. You know? <laughs> yeah. December 18th, 2014, end piracy. We'll save on <laughs> <laughs> and they'll just yeah. land it that day. One yeah. day they'll be in the next I, day. I, 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 right? I just did see a picture someone sent me of a demonstration of South Korean filmmakers against piracy. Yeah. So, no in, so, so something's happening. Can I, can I raise the different question to yeah. all of this, though, which is, I think, worth thinking about is, and I think is both the single great challenge and, in some ways, the single great opportunity. Basically, we've talked about a whole series of negative factors here, right. right? And all of which are going to have pretty profoundly negative impacts on the communications industry as we know it or as you guys are getting ready to enter. Um, and, and certainly impact the ability to generate profits, et cetera, et cetera. The converse is, and I think it's the really, ex I don't know if it's somewhere between exciting, terrifying, but fascinating, is that you have a global audience, a couple of billion people, who have a certain minimum threshold of quality that they are used to. You know, they're not gonna go back and start watching crap. They are used to right. television shows that cost two to three million dollars an episode to produce. Movies, the average American movie now costs a little over $70 million to produce. They are absolutely expectant of a certain level of quality. And all these things that are happening are going to pull profits out of the business. And, you know, somewhere there's going to have to be new financing models created because they're not all of a sudden going to say, I'm willing to watch $300,000 hours. I'm going to willing to watch, you know, amateur productions that take place out there. There's no going back. And in, if anything, that's expanded because it's expanded to a much more global audience who now has these expectations of quality. And the people who can begin to figure out two things, who can begin to figure out how to produce that level of quality more economically. Right. And there's an easy way to do that. You're just going to stop paying people a lot of money. And that's going to happen easily. You're going right. to see salary levels come way down. But you know, there's going to be various digital technologies employed that are going to be able to help bring down the cost of production. But then the other thing is figuring out new ways to f cobble together different financing schemes are going to be big opportunities in the years ahead because the size of the audience and the appetite of the audience is only going to grow. Okay, so Chris but Anderson. Just, but just to follow up on that, the, yeah. the, 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 there is enormous, I mean, we're talking about the old media. There's enormous value destruction. But there's enormous value creation going on. Enormous. In I mean, Google did not exist in January 1999. And it's got a $160 billion market cap. And it's gonna, next year, it's going to have $26 billion of advertising revenues go through their system. That's more than ABC, NBC, and, and CBS combined. And they've been around, well, in the case of CBS, has been around since the 30s. So um, the recorded music business, the recorded music business, the revenues are, have been cut in half in the last five years in the recorded music business. But Apple has a $190 billion market cap. Uh, so, um, you know, there, there's, the money hasn't gone away, it's just been reallocated. Okay, so one of Peter's former employees, Robert Thompson, the managing editor of the Wall Street Journal, said to Charlie Rose a few months ago, Google devalues everything it touches. Google is great for Google, but it's not great for the rest of the content <coughs> industry, meaning the New York Times, um, 
and maybe even the Wall Street Journal, although the Wall Street Journal is one of the few journalistic organs that's been able to keep its content behind a paid wall. Um, how does, because we have a journalism school, how is the New York Times going to live in this world when, the, when Google can monetize other people's content and the other people are not getting any value for that? That is the New York Times. You know, first of all, I don't, I don't, comp I, I don't completely agree with Robert's statement. I think there's a fair amount of demonizing of Google in there, because Google, you know, because the, you know, they've been saying Google's been stealing their content. That's just not true. What Google has been doing has been enabling searches to the New York Times website or to the Wall Street Journal website. Besides which, they have an ad. Well, they have an ad, but so does the New York Times has an ad on their own website. You know, and the New York Times could certainly say we're not going to put our content up on the website. In which case, Google has no role with the New York Times whatsoever at that point. Right. So, yes, Google is making money by directing people there, but to sort of demonize it and call that stealing from them, I think personally is a little bit of, right. of, of a stretch. Um, look, I, I think that the, the for whatever journalism students are here, it's a tough, <laughs> tough, 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 tough road. Time ahead. to find a new career. Right? Oh, oh no, Gordy, don't well, say that. Well, you know, I think, and I think that there are certainly implications as a society that we should talk about. But look, I, you know, I think the Wall Street Journal is going to be fine, probably less profitable than it was even when News Corp bought it two years ago. I think the New York Times will ultimately survive, probably at a less profitable level. I think you're going to see cost squeeze out of these things, but I think you're going to see wholesale, you know, death and dying of newspapers all over the place, and. You know, you will begin to see some little amounts of blogging sites and, and other sites begin to pick up, but I think that the long term, you know, this is, all of this stuff is ubiquitously available, and part of what made those newspapers so valuable is they were local monopolies, and there, there, there will still be, you know, massive amounts of information out there, probably more information than there is today, but it's not going to have the same economic value that it's had in the past, where there were these local monopolies that Everybody, every supermarket had to advertise in, every car dealer had to advertise in, et cetera. Now, the implications for a society are, with those massive things, came a certain, I would contend, and we, you know, I'm sure we could all decide which ones we agree with and which aren't, but came a certain level of editorial responsibility, and I would contend that that's probably going to diminish. There will be more opinions. Yeah. Because, I mean, you talk about a parochial and short shot short-sighted business, certainly the news business was, certainly it's challenged economically, but in addition to what other creators of content have faced, we didn't even train people to expect to pay really for the news, they did expect to pay for music, they did, you know, the model as you said was an unfair pricing model, but we enter this period now of such challenge for the news industry with an assumption on the part of the public that they don't pay for it, because really advertisers have paid right. for it, so there's not even a a place to go where you have an expectation, you know, that you will pay. I think it's a particularly challenging. <laughs> and look, I, I don't just, believe they will pay for it. But when you say all this information is out there, an awful lot of what that information you're talking about is out there because of the news media, which are being. Which you, but you but there will be, you know, there there will be, you know, there there will be vast amounts of information. What there won't be is. You know, the New York Times paying for 37 news bureaus around the world, or, you know, CBS News, or ABC News, or et cetera. Or anybody but, at the water board right? in Peoria. But there will be tons of information. There will be people blogging. There will be little local sites. There will be somebody, you know, there will be. Yeah, the, is, the, is that you know, There will be somebody at the local water board. Yeah. Okay. It yeah. just won't be the it won't be a reporter from journalist. the Cleveland Plains dealer. Well, that's, that's all. That's not where bloggers are for the most part now. Yeah, well, not, not, but it's not going to be just bloggers. I mean, but it's not where reporters are either. I mean, I mean newspapers. <laughs> newspapers are so are so dead. Uh, I mean, aside from the the Wall Street Journal and stuff. I mean, honestly, I mean, just think about the concept of a newspaper. You cut down a bunch of trees. You boil them. You make paper out of them. In the old days, you used to have lead movable type, okay, and a bunch of ink, and a unionized shop printing them out. Then you you get a bunch of trucks. And you drive around the neighborhood and you throw them on somebody's driveway. You throw on somebody's driveway yesterday's news. Now, that's what we're tr trying to defend. We're, we're going to live in a world, well, no, I'm just, let me finish. We're going to live in a world, we're going to live in a world where the news is instantaneously updated. 
and it's going to come to you on your Kindle or your Apple tablet or your computer screen, and it's going to and that's what's going to be. Now, um, is it going to be the the local news reporter of uh, this would be the sports reporter of the LA Times, or is it going to be ESPNLosAngeles.com that people, when they get up in the morning, instead of having a cup of coffee and reading the sports section, they're going to get a cup of coffee and look at their computer or their ta or their Kindle, and they're going to read ESPN LA, which is going to have a great, you know, local sports or, news site. Or is it going to be five and, bloggers who went to the game that yeah, day? Yeah, and, okay, and, 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 and somebody's going to come up with LA.com that's going to watch the school board and stuff because that's what they're passionate about. And, and, and then you're going to have, people will, I don't even know how it's all going to work, but, but, but you're going to figure out how to aggregate those things that you're interested in and have your sources of trusted information. As far as the editorial process, they're going to get winnowed out because people that say stuff that's not accurate and stuff are going to go down and people that are, become trusted sources are going to go up. And okay, so I, I think it's, Geneva raised a really good point. Um, Malcolm Gladwell, whom we probably all know from The Tipping Point and stuff like that, wrote a review of Chris Anderson's book, his new book called Free, the Future of a Radical Price. And he basically said, you know, Anderson's theory is it's all got to be free. Nobody's going to pay for anything anymore. Now, that doesn't mean you can't put advertising next to it and everything, but it's going to be free. And, and Gladwell said, it seems to me that Anderson is suggesting that the New York Times should become like a volunteer organization, like a Meals on Wheels, you know, that whoever feels like writing about the water board today will turn their thing in. That cannot be, obviously, what we're training people to do here. We're training them to be editors. We're training them to understand what's gossip and what's news. So, you know, our hope is we're, we're certainly never going to defend the piece of paper, but we are going to defend the idea that a trusted group of editors and writers can get paid to well, deliver to, the to, news. To be fair, you can defend it all you want, but unless the public is willing to add to that defense by paying for no, it, okay. your so, defense is so let's, Okay, so right. let's get back to the question of how does it get but, paid for. But, let's, let me get, but let me just ask, a, just to be difficult yeah, here for a second. I love that. Um, you know, if you had the New York Times of crowdsourced journalism, so you had one place where you gathered many of the best journalists in the world, and you began to crowdsource stories from them. You began to open it up to everybody in the world, and you sort of got the best, right? You could probably aggregate a pretty decent audience out of that, and I think what Gordy said is true, which is it would begin to rise because it would be looked at as a valuable source, and I guess the question I would ask is Wikipedia, which does not pay a single person, is that particularly worse than the Encyclopedia Britannica or the World Book or whatever those? What, just started now. People but but but, but a tiny, but tiny little people. Yeah. But a tiny, tiny. But Wikipedia a month ago, where they weren't paying anybody yet, is that worse than the encyclopedias all of us read as kids? Actually, without paying a single person, without a single so-called reliable source, mm -hmm. just crowdsourced mm -hmm. and sort of a, a crowd-dominated editorial process to try and. The best. Look, I would love nothing more. I happen to love newspapers. I'd love nothing more than for them to thrive forever. But I do think we have to be careful about sort of romanticizing this. I think it's a very, very, very difficult road ahead. I just want to note that I don't necessarily think that we're training the people who are going to be paid to go and do this. I do believe that we're thinking as a journalism school about precisely these questions. How are people going to be able to continue to get the information that they need? And in fact, crowdsourcing distributed reporting is going to be an important part of it. And the man who wrote the book on Wikipedia is sitting, I don't know if Andrew is with us, but we absolutely embrace all this. We're not defending some, I love your remarkable description of hard copy <laughs> newspapers. No but that's not what we're defending. But I would think that your particular take on this, Peter, would be influenced by your own assumptions that there will or will be not be a, a smart route forward for the paywall, which clearly you all have decided. Well, I don't work there anymore. Yeah, but number one. when you did. And, and I think that paywall is going to be much, much tougher than they do. Much tougher than they do. I think, I, I, you know, I'm, I haven't been privy to their conversations about it for the last 90 days. But I think there's a big difference between asking people to pay for the Wall Street Journal, where there is 
for people who are in the financial services industry, a quantifiable benefit for to it. And, there's and the some, company pays a right? lot of it. And the company pays a lot of it. And there's some scarcity to that news. That news is not ubiquitously available to asking people to pay for the Dodgers. Perfect example. You know, coverage of the Dodgers. There's 50,000 fans. I used to own it. You know, we used to own the Dodgers. I guarantee 49,000 of them think they know more about the team than anybody else does. You could probably, you know, there's probably 300 of them blogging about every single game and probably some of them with a fair amount of insight. And I think that what passes for the regular American newspaper, you know, the, to me the big question will be the New York Times, which maybe you can get them to pay for. Right. But the LA Times, does the LA Times have a paid wall market? I'd be well. shocked. It barely and has a paid market for the crappy newspaper they delivered you today. <laughs> and different, different <laughs> models will evolve. Like, we, we both know Kara Swisher. Okay, Kara was a reporter for the Wall Street Journal on the digital world. Mm -hmm. So she now has uh, All Things D, which is a website. She makes all of her money on her conference. She makes, I don't know, three or four million dollars on the conference. So that's, that's how she's decided how to make a living. And, and you know, the Huffington Post, is, uh, there's all these different models. And I'm not smart to figure out how, what, what they are, but they, models will evolve because People today are consuming more news than they ever consumed. They're listening to more music than they ever listened to, and they're watching more video than they ever did. But the business models are going to change, and the big presses downtown. Uh, Let me also say one thing, just to give you a little bit of hope. This is the particular in the newspaper side. It's not going to happen overnight. Right. You know, it's going to take a while. And to the degree that even those traditional newspapers shifted from paper to electronic, there's vast, probably 75% of the costs of those newspapers have nothing to do with creating and packaging the news. They are, you know, those, we just, at News Corps, which is, you know, I think probably still the largest newspaper publisher in the world, we just spent two plus billion dollars buying new printing plants a couple years ago. And, you know, you sort of know going in that it's, it's folly because you're, you're investing in, in a non-future. But those printing plants are insanely expensive. The trucks, the union workforces, all of those things. So as those costs go out of the business, and those will go out of business, the newsroom, you know, if you can get a little bit of modest payments from people, that model may sustain for a little bit longer. But I think the long-term okay. trends are scary. So, so let's talk about an idea that you and I discussed a, a year and a half ago, which is... Uh, there's about a billion broadband subscribers in the world today projected to go to two billion. Um, needless to say, most of the reason people get broadband is to get streaming content and all sorts of new stuff, the entertainment that we're talking about. Um, if you look at a business that you just mentioned, the music publishing business, music publishing business is one of the bright spots in the entertainment field. It's at a time when the record business is crashing, the music publishing business, net collections are up about 8% a year. That's because every Gap store you go into, every restaurant, every bar, every elevator that's playing music is paying a license, a flat fee license to BMI and ASCAP. And so collections, more and more places are playing music. What would be wrong with assessing a global copyright license fee at the ISP level of three or four bucks a month um, and pulling it all in and just like ASCAP and BMI by sampling first and then eventually by the routers reading the actual watermarks of everything, doling it out amongst the people who own the copyrights. Anybody have any thoughts? It would be fantastic for the media industry. <laughs> <laughs> Whether or not it's politically viable is a different question, but in terms of, you know, it'd be a great thing for the music, for the, the media business. Um, Gordon, you got any thoughts? I, I don't. I've never really thought of, I've never okay. heard it proposed, and I don't know quite how it would work. And well, it's just a collection supply, just like ASCAP and BMI. But are you saying anybody then could run Go On With The Wind? And yeah. Yeah. I mean, it wouldn't prevent you from selling a DVD yeah. of Gone with Wind with all the extras and everything else. But the fact it would it would reimburse you for the cost that everybody's yeah. streaming. Your I, I, I just my guess is, without having thought about it uh, more than uh, twelve seconds, is that the revenues that you could collect with a small fee would never replace what's currently. Well, being it's, let's say it's which, about six. You could collect about sixty billion a year today. 160 billion a year in a few years. 
That sounds very ambitious. Yeah. Well, See, most of the broadband subscribers are in China, and, and yeah. you're not okay. going to get anything. Well, let's, let's not get stuck. Uh, we're going to open up the, the, the floor to um, questions. Anybody who wants to ask a question? Chris? Um, fascinating discussion. I was just curious in terms of the shape of the overall economy to come. What do you make of the next shooter drop with government indebtedness and the private sector, the excess of leverage that's been <coughs> absorbed from the private sector into the public sector? What's going to come of that? What, are we going, what, what will be the next step? to actually manage that indebtedness and what lingering and enduring effects from the credit crunch might impact the media business? You're much more economically uh, motivated than I am, so maybe you can answer that. <laughs> motivated or? <laughs> Something, right? Savvy um, and motivated. Well, look, uh, nothing good will come of it. Um, we, are, we, are, we are becoming uh, a hugely indebted society, uh, both at the public level and at the consumer level. I mean, that, let, let's face it, that's why we've gotten into the mess that we're in, is for the last <coughs> 25 years, uh, the United States consumer has been recklessly leveraging up and spending more than they have. And so, uh, you know, consumer debt to GDP since 1980 has gone from like under 60% to over 100, to 130%. So we're just an over-leveraged society. The government debt, particularly after the crisis, is just blowing out. Um, Do you feel the media sector is over-leveraged or, or not as much as it no, used the, to be? Not anymore. It's pretty, pretty, pretty reasonably. Well, look, it, it, um, that gets into a whole different conversation. Um, the newspaper companies and the radio companies and the television companies that were pure companies, mm -hmm. they all leveraged up in the 90s and they're I looked the other day, and um, you know, Gannett went from 100 to three. So they're all getting wiped out because they did over leverage. But if you're talking about the big four conglomerates, mm -hmm. no, they're 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 in very comfortable shape. But anyhow, we're, we're we we're we're in very poor shape. And when you when you think globally, it's no surprise to me that. You know, China's growing their economy 8% this year. India's growing their economy 6% this year. Even Brazil is going to be up 1%. And uh, the U.S. And, and the U.K. and Japan are having, you know, huge down in GDP. We're going to have a deficit that's 12% of our, um, of our budget. Uh, you know, if you put a little piece of tape over the names of the countries, you'd almost pick the data of the United States and the UK and call us an emerging market and China a developed market if you looked at it. So it's not good. I mean, Well, that's what I'm just good. wondering. Where, where do you look as a big media company to find the sweet spot in your customer base? Do you look globally? Is well, the US customer Yeah, let, let's, let's focus this company? even more. Peter, you guys made an investment in India last year, right, in making Indian movies? And Indian well, we made a much bigger investment in India Welcome, probably though. 12 to 15 years ago. Okay, so India's a big, big market. Okay, for what is the? I mean, the old plan of the U.S. was well, I, I, make I, movies I answer, here and force I can them that down very quickly. If you yeah. were to, if you were to come with a blank piece of paper and say where are you going to invest in in the media business, because some ways I can do that right now. It is right. part of the process. I think you invest in two places. You invest in digital media, and you invest in the developing world. Right. You stay out of the U.S. You stay out of Western Europe. Right. Right. And you stay out of broadcast and newspapers and these traditional media. Right. That's where the growth is going to be. Don't you agree? That's in my in my portfolio because I run a diversified portfolio. I'm I love India, uh, Brazil, China. Uh, where I have to own U.S. companies, I like U.S. companies that have a large part of their revenues outside the United States. There's no question that the next 25 years, that I don't know, pick a number, 75 percent of the incremental growth of the global GDP is going to come in the emerging markets. That's where the people are. That's where the unmet needs are. That's where the flow of capital is going, and they're not over levered, uh, and so that's where the growth is going to be. So, okay, so yeah, what you'd, are you'd want? If I if I was running a media company, I would do exactly what Peter just okay, said. Okay, so what are the barriers? Because you face this, of investing in China for a, a, an American or a global media company. They're almost infinite, but but yeah. there aren't. <laughs> China you probably can't do much right now, but you can do a heck of a lot in can India. Can you do joint ventures? 
You know what? You can pretend to do various things. You cannot make money in China. Right now, right? um, but you can do a lot in India. You can do a lot in Indonesia. You can do a lot in the Philippines. You can do a lot in sort of the greater China, non-mainland China, great mm -hmm. Taiwan, et cetera. You can do Brazil's a great market. Most of the rest of Latin America. I'll give you a look, just to put that point. Out, we started a widow international cable division four years ago. I think our total investment was $100 million. Mm -hmm. We're making four, $450 million profit now. And it'll be a billion dollars in profit by 2012. And all we're doing is we're starting little cable channels right. in Brazil, in Estonia, and we got eight channels in Turkey. We got, you know, Turkey, big, big growth market, Turkey, 100 million people. Right. Middle East going to be a big growth market. So right. they're, you know, stay out of the U.S. and stay out of Western Europe. Right. And, and you mentioned movies, you know, the, the, and the old model was you make a movie and then you distribute it around the world. Right. And to me, the new model is, and, and most of the companies are getting onto this now, but, it, but this is what I would do. Is, is you've got your sales guy selling Warner Brothers or 20th Century right. Fox movies in Germany. Right. Okay, you ought to be making local German product so that when you go into the theaters or you go to the DVD market, you have both the US product and your own German product. Right. And you really want to be making them in Hindi, Mandarin, and Spanish, because well, that's, that's where the, the big markets started. are. Right. But even, even you look at the mainstream movies, you know, I'll ask you question, what do people think was the most, the most successful movie of this past summer? That's exactly right. Ice Age 3, which did $200 million in the US and has done $650 million in international box office. Right. And gives you a sense of the potential size of the, you know, dwarfs the Transformers. Yeah. And I mean, we used that? to say the US was 60% of the world market. Right. Now, yeah. I mean, OK. Anybody, students? Yeah. Yeah, no, but I say, so if you are looking at, first of all, when they work, yes. Um, and and my, my point was different, which is if the DVD market disappears, you cannot afford to make those big franchise movies. As much as you want to, they're just not going to be affordable. Um, the DVD market is 50% of the revenues for these things. And so my point is more that the public is still going to want that level of quality and you guys, frankly, more than me, are going to have to figure out a way to produce it. But you were also saying you wouldn't pay an actor $20 million just to show up, right? I mean, that's part of driving down costs. Yeah, well, the easy place that costs are going to come out are they going to come out of, they're going to come out of executives. They're going to come out of everyone working on these movies. They're going to come out of actors working on these right. movies. And then they're going to come out of various, you know, digital help you do some things. There'll be new lighting technologies, et cetera. But, but by the way, on your thing about they make the, the big movies where they make money or want to make them, you know, Star Trek probably will make no money, and Hangover is going to make a gazillion dollars. Right. So. Right. Okay, in the back there. Stand up and talk loud. I'd just like to return to this question of a, a global copyright fee for a moment. How does a, a one size fits all pricing model like that take into account the fact that three to four dollars a month in Indonesia is something very different than three to four dollars a month here? Well, I, I'm just. I, I came up with the idea because, you know, broadband service fee in, 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 in Japan is 40 bucks a month. Broadband service fee in China is about 38 bucks a month. It's, it's relatively standardized what people are paying for a month's worth of broadband. And by the way, in Japan, as you noted, they're getting 50 megabits a second for their $40. So, I mean, the ability, the point that Gordon made the idea that we're not going to be moving gigantic movie files downloading is a, a fool's errand. Anyone who thinks that what happened to the music business isn't going to happen to the movie business is just uh, on drugs, you know. Okay, yeah. Or do you see something else happening with the, the, the movie industry uh, and, and like a new, a new supply chain business model for how movies get delivered to the public? 
first of all, I have no idea whether the consent decree will be reversed. I'm not sure that there's an enormous amount of pressure from anybody to do so, so my guess is it won't be. Even if it were, I don't think you'd see studios. You know, you have what Warner's primarily owns some movie theaters still. Um, but I don't think you see studios in any particular, um, have any particular appetite to own movie theaters. I think what you're going to see, I guess the better example and probably the more contemporary example is something that, you know, I just did, which is starting Hulu, which is basically Hulu is next generation distribution model started by, in this case, two companies started by Fox and NBC. Um, so you'll see studios, and I believe appropriately, so I think that's what studios should be doing, is trying to build new business models that are appropriate to new distribution models and trying to experiment. But, you know, it does go back to the, something we said almost an hour ago, which is, you know, when, when I started Hulu, I would guess 90% of the people inside the company hated it because they kept saying it's going to cannibalize this, it's going to cannibalize this, and it is going to cannibalize it. There's no question it's going to cannibalize it. And, you know, my point was always that it's going to get cannibalized whether we like it or not, and we're better off doing it to ourselves than having somebody come in from the outside doing it. Right. Gordy, the future of theatrical movies. Uh, James Cameron seems to say that 3D will save... Uh, the theatrical movie-going experience? You, you know, the, the, there'll always be theaters. Uh, people love sitting in a room, having the lights go down, and experiencing with another group of human beings the emotions of being scared or crying or laughing. I mean, that, that's never going away. But to go back to your question, it's not a growth business. It hasn't been a growth business since 1949. So <laughs> the studios are not... No studio is interested in a theater. The only studios that own theaters were principally in overseas markets where they were trying to seed the market by doing a joint venture and developing theaters in it, but then they sell them off as soon as the market develops. They have no interest in that business. If you're the head of, a, if you're the head of, a, of an entertainment conglomerate, you want to figure out what the next growth area is going to be. So like Peter said, you're looking at digital or, or foreign or something. You're not looking at trying to acquire a, a distribution system that's going nowhere. Okay, one last question. Hi, thank you. Speak up. transnational companies in China? Is it the regulation of the media there? Is it like the intellectual problem, problem you just mentioned? And what do you think like the future of China, Chinese market? For you? First of all, no Western companies can make money. There are plenty of Chinese companies can make money there. You know, I think it's primarily, it's 80, 90% regulatory driven, which is that you just can't, you're not allowed to distribute your product. You know, there are 10 movies you're allowed to be distributed, you're not allowed. You know, the most you're allowed to distribute television content is to five-star hotels and some government complexes. So you're just not allowed to distribute. You're not allowed to have access with your content to the public to either charge advertising or money. Um, and then secondly, there is, on the stuff, that, the, the stuff that gets out there anyway gets out pirated, so you don't make money on it. But that'll change. I, I, I agree with you. I think that'll change, change over, over time. time. It'll change. Okay, so we're Can out. I say one? Yeah, yeah. One hopeful thing? Yeah, yeah. Because we've talked yeah. a lot about it. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Because given that I assume most of you are thinking about the job market at some point, I do want to say that I actually think it is the most exciting time to enter the media business. And I think it is a time of, I think there will be more jobs than there have ever been. I think there will be more opportunities. I think there will be more challenges. I think, honestly, it's going to be much harder than when I did it. Um, but, you know, I think it's the most exciting time in the world to be 23 years old. And I think it's a world of limitless opportunities, of incredible intellectual challenges, and, and great you know, the, many more jobs than ever existed. There's so much more content being created and produced. That, you know, this, the salary road may not be as easy for the people on the top, but I don't think that anyone should look at, you know, what, a lot of what we've been talking about is what's happening to the traditional media companies. There's an entire world, and it should maybe be your next session, of, of the new opportunities that are going to be created outside of these traditional media businesses, and they're going to be extraordinary. And I, if, if I were you, I'd suggest it should be a time of incredible optimism and incredible excitement. Uh, I'm I mean, just to put this in historical context, when I came into the movie business in 73 with Marty Scorsese, the only reason young film students got to make movies was because the old business was dying. They, Fox mm -hmm. had made so many bad movies that they had to sell off the lot to make Century City. I mean, so these creative destruction moments are great moments for can everybody. I, can I see a final yeah. prediction, too? Yeah. Um, what you guys, those of you who are training to be journalists, what you're doing, don't get it confused with our doer outlook on, on the 
actual model of a economic model of a newspaper company. What you, what you do as a journalist is is one of the most important professions that we have. You cannot have a functioning democracy. Uh, you cannot have a functioning democracy at all, and you can't have a functioning democracy in a city like Los Angeles, which is m one of the most multicultural places in the world, without the spotlight of great uh, journalism. And uh, when, when I'm not working at Capitol, one of the things I do is I'm chairman of the board of Southern California Public Radio, KPCC. And we're passionate on the, on the topic, okay? It's critical if the LA Times goes down or that business model doesn't work, we need somebody at the LA School Board and at the power and the water. And you, you, you need that in a democracy. And we need great journalism. And, and I, I, get, I despair sometimes when I watch Fox News or <laughs> MSNBC. So do I. And I see people <laughs> yelling at each other and talking over each other. And they become almost really entertainers. Uh, and not real journalists. Real journalists are critical to our society, and, and models will evolve for your work to get out there, and it's an extremely important function in our society. Great. I want to thank you. <laughs> We're excited about the future, too. We think the opportunities are great for journalism. Those have to be